It was about five years ago this month that pianist Georgi Latsabidze performed at the Mock Chunk Opera House in Jim Thorpe. That's when we first met him in conversation on Art Scene. And through some touching photographs from his childhood in Tbilisi, Georgia, on his website. He told us a number of cherished family stories about his magnetic pull to the piano at the age of three, about how he would not want to go visiting with his mother and father unless their hosts had a piano in their home so that he could play. His parents were engineers, not musicians, but they recognized early on that their little son was made to make music, and they arranged for studies that have continued from his home country to Southern California, where he received a doctoral degree. Georgi Latsabitze is an award-winning pianist, a teacher, and a composer who often creates scores for movie soundtracks. And now, when we visit him and his website, we see photographs of a self-assured performer, a young man who smiles broadly as he's surrounded by young students in Asia, totally present to them in their enthusiasm. He's dressed to the nines for concerts in some of these shots and very casual out and about as he explores the world he's touring. The poet John O'Donohue reminds us that in a deep, deep way, being at home in your own nature makes for a real sense of belonging. And as we speak with Georgi now, five years later, the deep connection he has with music has allowed him to be at home wherever he is in the world. And with that belonging, that sense of belonging, comes a peace and a joy that he can communicate through the music he chooses to perform for his audiences. As he explores the range of emotion in Chopin, Mozart, Debussy, and Rachmaninoff, as he'll do this Sunday in Jim Thorpe, for instance, he seems to discover ever more deeply what it means to be human And that rich understanding puts him in a deep relation to himself, to others, to the world around him, and he's not afraid to use the word to the transcendent. Music is that important to Georgi Latsabitze. The Mark Chunk Opera House in Jim Thorpe will present Georgi Latsabitze this Sunday, May 13th, at 5 in the afternoon, performing at the Opera House's remarkable 1898 chickering nine-foot grand piano, recently refurbished. The program will feature Mozart's variations on A vous direz je maman, Twelve Preludes, Opus 28, of Frédéric Chopin, Claude Debussy, Preludes, Book 2, and Preludes of Rachmaninoff as well. We had a chance to speak by phone with Georgi Latsabitze about his music and his growth as an artist since we last spoke. You just mentioned the word growth. Uh, I think every artist has a desire to grow and to have basically that direction to the perfection. I just mentioned to the Wayne that there is not such things existing as a perfection, but you still have a desire to perfect things, and I think that's the same. Not only Chopin, it's uh, basically related to any other composers. You have a desire to perfect, to polish things, and uh, that's the same thing now. I just play Chopin Preludes. Uh, I don't quite remember what I played the last time there. I think it was Sonata B minor, but it's a beautiful um, cycle of Opus 28 and called Preludes. I will be playing only 12 Preludes this time, not the whole cycle, but I think it's beautifully uh, you know, described the soul of the Chopin in those Preludes because this is kind of one of the late opuses. And besides the Chopin, I'll be playing other composers too. This will be Mozart. Uh, Rachmaninoff and some Debussy. Well, you know, you have Debussy preludes and right. also Rachmaninoff preludes. How are their approach to this little form different right. and the same? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting topic you brought. It's, uh, I call this recital actually Preludiana because basically all of the pieces I play, they're called preludes, <laughs> except the one, it's uh, Mozart uh, variations, uh, those are not called preludes. But uh, Rachmaninoff, Debussy, and the Chopin I have in the program, those all called preludes, and um, uh, I don't know, I just thought what would be the title of my recital, and maybe that would be the most appropriate word to it. Uh, now, prelude is descriptive title of the certain composition. In Debussy's um, case, he puts titles, descriptive titles for 
for each composition, and that's uh, actually from the book second. He has two books of the preludes, and Rahman, you know, I'm playing you know, Opus 23 and uh, some preludes from 32. This is a uh, late opus, and uh, those are not descriptive titles. It's just the uh, numbers, and in Chopin also, those are the numbers. I watched on YouTube your performance of Fudati Feast, the fireworks. You take us down to the quietest, quietest moment and the eruption. Do you have all the fireworks you've ever seen in your soul? How does your experience of the world interact with what Debussy has on the page? Well, Erika, this is an interesting question. I think... You are on the very right track. You should have certain image when you play uh, those kind of pieces. Now, Debussy puts uh, titles because he is always related to impressionism and the art. Well, for example, he has the titles as Dead Leaves. He has titles like Fudartifis, which is firework, and he has a canopy, and he has a fog. Basically, all these kind of titles are related to the weather or a certain movement of impression is now Fedaktifis is not, of course a firework and you should have the image of those beautiful uh, firework going on in the sky you know and I have seen I don't know how many times in my life beautiful firework and maybe when I play that I relate somehow to this image yeah that makes sense because it's who you are as a human being and as a musician bringing us your conversation as I suggest with Debussy and the notes he gives you Right, absolutely, I totally agree. And one of the things that has fascinated me since the last time we talked was your artistic statement. You mentioned the idea of music and complexity. Then you say something that sounds like a paradox. You talk about a genuine birth of silence. This is music. What's the silence-music relationship for you? Well, uh, you know, uh, this is kind of a transcendental question. I can tell you, uh, I'll answer you very simply. I think silence is itself a music. And everyone who doesn't have any clue about music, they, I think, would understand what I mean. Uh, the silence itself, if you just listen to the silence, you know, that is a part of music. Now, in a music, when you play the composer's creation, uh, you uh, have a lot of pauses, you have a lot of rest, and that includes and music. No matter what composer you play, you know, any any rest in a music composition, for example, in Mozart, Mozart itself, he was saying that part of my music is a silence. Please listen to it and be careful of it. And uh, always be conscious of it and have a concern on it. So uh, when Mozart composed piano work or symphony or opera, uh, you see a lot of rest there and a lot of pauses and uh, You should take that seriously. You should uh, consider that as a music, too. I remember hearing a lecture by Daniel Barenboim in Boston. He was at the keyboard. He sat there and he said, you have to remember, for us as musicians, the music doesn't start with that first note. As we're approaching the keyboard, for example, the music is coming out of the silence. Oh, my God, absolutely. I'm sorry interrupting you. That is absolutely uh, right, uh, because the music is coming out of the silence. It is coming out of the silence, and it is going to the silence. So when you finish a work, no matter you playing a how long is the piece, or uh, how three forte or four forte, how loud is as possible, you finish it, it is still going to the silence. Well, you mentioned yeah. Mozart, and, and we know that you have a Mozart for us. I was interested in, for example, when you might play the variations on A vous direz je maman. And, right. And you have created your own take on Arnold Schoenberg, for example, improvisation uh-huh. variations. How does what you're doing with Arnold Schoenberg's music compare to, for example, what Mozart might be doing with the little tune A vous direz je maman? Similar, different? Uh, yeah, there is maybe similarity, but see, we, we can't forget that at that time the Mozart was composing pieces and the theme itself taken in his composition, it's limited and he can do only so much. Now, when we are dealing with Schomburg, it is a, a tonal music, a plus 12 tone music, and you have more possibilities to kind of play around. Mm-hmm. See, you have more variety of the keyboard because in the back, in the Mozart's time, there was not such pianos that we have right now. Now. And here now in variations in Schomburg, you can do things that you could not do back now, like 300 or 400 years ago. 
And Mozart has humor, and you have humor. You have humor in your approach when I you think were. You should have humor when, when no matter you know uh, how big or uh, how small you are uh, as as it comes to the musician. You should have always a humor, and because that's something the very uh, beautiful uh, as it comes to the individuality, you know, sense of humor. You should always have and keep it, uh, and also simplicity. I think I would. Uh, uh, I would bring that topic uh, and make it parallel to the greatest artist of the 20th century, maybe, perhaps, uh, Vladimir Horowitz, because he was the one of the greatest artists with this beautiful sense of simplicity. Listen to his playing, listen to his performance, and you'll see how simple, how childish he is when he's playing. You listen to jazz? Uh, I do, I do. I love jazz. Uh, good jazz, of course. You know, I'm a big fan of Art Tatum. I am a big uh, fan of Oscar Peterson or uh, Louis Armstrong or Keith Jade or, or Jarrett or, or Bill Evans. You know, those are wonderful professionals. Actually, Keith Jarrett was born not far from the Mock Chunk Opera House. When you... Oh, how wonderful. And speaking of the Mock Chunk Opera House, do you remember that experience in 2007? I do. In fact, I do have a picture taken from it. <laughs> it's, a, it's an intimate space, a nice space to play. Oh, it's, you know, I, again, uh, it's no matter how big or the small space is and how intimate. I mean, there is intimacy always involved, of course, and I do love performing in intimate spaces or in a huge spaces and uh, huge halls, you know. They can be a uh, size like an Albert Hall or a uh, Concert Gebau in Holland or very intimate spaces and uh, such as chamber music and then uh, very, very little uh, spaces or the halls. I mean, you know, no matter how big or small it is, it's a matter of how you deliver your music and how you project and how you share it to the audience. That's the main purpose of, the, I think, a music and artist. And you love music so much that you will travel around the world and you will do an East Coast tour because you really have this passion. Yeah, I do. You just mentioned uh, what traveling. I do travel a lot and sometimes... Uh, when people ask me, oh, well, where do you live? I say, you know, well, I live, um, half of my life I live in airplanes or in hotels, you know, and that's the way how it is. I mean, you know, when you choose the profession, that's the way how it goes. But I'm the lucky one maybe because I love traveling and I do enjoy it all the time. So it's uh, maybe one of the advantages. <laughs> what has happened in terms of your growth as a person, for example, in interacting with musicians, young people, people from China? China, Taiwan, Japan. Uh -huh. I love working with the talented people. You know, uh, you always think how to inspire them, how to motivate them. And that's basically always the m main agenda I always have, you know, when I give master classes. No matter what country is it, Japan or Taiwan or China uh, or in Europe or in USA, you know, you're basically always thinking of how to motivate these people and, and, of course, lead to the right direction because they have so many things to you know, kind of uh, go through, and uh, they sometimes don't realize it, how challenging it can be, but you don't mention this. You just have to direct them the right way and conduct them the right way and then uh, give them the right direction and uh, as much as possible just inspire them. There's some wonderful photos of you in Chinese settings, some beautiful temple-like scrolls and right. wonderful old settings. How do you respond to architecture. There's that old saw about architecture is frozen music. You seem to be just very comfortable, whether you're in a palace in Salzburg or in a temple <laughs> in China. Yeah, I know. You know, it's a, I don't know, I feel comfortable everywhere. I, I swear, I just don't I just don't think that uh, there is any place that I would not like in the world. I love discovering new countries. And uh, is this temple or is this just a cathedral or it's a church or whatever it is, you know, I feel always comfortable everywhere. I mean, China or in uh, Taiwan, they have their traditions you should respect and there are things that you should not do. When you enter a temple, uh, you should be very respectful, very quiet. But uh, it's such a, you know, uh, such a um, aura, you know, it's... Uh, uh, so beautiful out there, you know, you uh, kind of uh, see and uh, praying and uh, take a candle and, and then uh, wish what you want to wish and uh, just enjoy that atmosphere. It's ambiance unbelievable. I mean, really, in a temple and the smell inside of the temple is really unbelievable. So all of your senses are sensitive. Yeah, you see, uh, my life is uh, based on sensitivity. <laughs> 
you have this wonderful ebullience and optimism and love of life and sensitivity to all of the range of human emotion, the pains as well as the joys. Right. But a lot of people are economically suffering. What can music do for us in 2012 or in this time of our lives? How does music nourish us? Well, you know, uh, I know a lot of people suffering, and there was always uh, back then, and uh, it's now, and it will be maybe, but um, music is something that feeds us. It feeds us spiritually, you know, and I understand that so many people economically are uh, just struggling, but I think that music is one of the ways to make them happy and to to uh, make them just think uh, or not think about those Think that what they have, like the worries, and the, you know, someone has a, a economic crisis, someone has financial financial difficulties. So they just forget about those things. You just play for them, and then are totally involved in your music, and they make make them so happy. You know, I have heard in, uh, so many times coming people to me and say, you know, uh, I just you know made my day on one. Hour. That was a one-hour concert, but I forgot about all worries what I had, and I just uh, want to stay with this. But unfortunately, of course, life is tough. <laughs> you don't stay with this, and uh, life reminds you what it is, how tough it is tomorrow. You'll be playing on Mother's Day, and there will be a lot of people in the audience who have brought their mothers to you. Is your mother still with us? Is she still alive? Oh, yeah, I love my mother, I love my father, both parents. They are in, actually, Georgia, and um, I've been uh, talking with them, and they are uh, doing great, and they are um, following me, so... And it must be wonderful now, because they can follow you on the Internet. We do uh, we do speak on a Skype, so uh, it's uh, very easy to basically report what's going on right here. And, I, and I'm happy to make them proud, of course. International pianist Yuri Ladzvitsay speaking with us in anticipation of his performance this weekend at the Mokchonk Opera House in Jim Thorpe. He will perform Sunday, May 13th, Mother's Day, at 5 in the afternoon at the remarkable 1898 Chickering 9-foot grand piano at the Opera House, recently refurbished. It possesses a distinctive warm sound, and it is really a remarkable chance to hear music of Mozart, Chopin, Debussy, and Rachmaninoff on this instrument interpreted by Georgi Latsibitze. The program will feature 12 variations on A vous direz je maman by Mozart, 12 preludes from Opus 28 of Chopin, preludes from Book 2 of Claude Debussy, and Preludes, Opus 23 and Opus 32 selections by Rachmaninoff. For more information, on the web, mockchunkoperahouse.com, M-A-U-C-H, mockchunkoperahouse.com. That's Sunday, May 13th at 5 p.m. at the Mock Chunk Opera House in Jim Thorpe, www.mockchunkoperahouse.com. <laughs>